the picture of dorian gray by oscar wilde chapter eleven part one for years dorian gray could not free himself from the influence of this book or perhaps it would be more accurate to say that he never sought to free himself from it he procured from paris no less than nine large paper copies of the first edition and had them bound in different colours so that they might suit his various moods and the changing fancies of a nature over which he seemed at times to have almost entirely lost control the hero the wonderful young parisian in whom the romantic and the scientific temperaments were so strangely blended became to him a kind of prefiguring type of himself and indeed the whole book seemed to him to contain the story of his own life written before he had lived it in one point he was more fortunate than the novel's fantastic hero he never knew never indeed had any cause to know that somewhat grotesque dread of mirrors and polished metal surfaces and still water which came upon the young parisian so early in his life and was occasioned by the sudden decay of a beauty that had once apparently been so remarkable it was with an almost cruel joy and perhaps in nearly every joy as certainly in every pleasure cruelty has its place that he used to read the latter part of the book with its really tragic if somewhat over-emphasised account of the sorrow and despair of one who had himself lost what in others and the world he had most dearly valued for the wonderful beauty that had so fascinated basil hallward and many others besides him seemed never to leave him even those who had heard the most evil things against him and from time to time strange rumours about his mode of life crept through london and became the chatter of the clubs could not believe anything to his dishonour when they saw him he had always the look of one who had kept himself unspotted from the world men who talked grossly became silent when dorian gray entered the room there was something in the purity of his face that rebuked them his mere presence seemed to recall to them the memory of the innocence that they had tarnished they wondered how one so charming and graceful as he was could have escaped the stain of an age that was at once sordid and sensual often on returning home from one of those mysterious and prolonged absences that gave rise to such strange conjecture among those who were his friends or thought that they were so he himself would creep upstairs to the locked room open the door with the key that never left him now and stand with a mirror in front of the portrait that basil hallward had painted of him looking now at the evil and ageing face on the canvas and now at the fair young face that laughed back at him from the polished glass the very sharpness of the contrast used to quicken his sense of pleasure he grew more and more enamoured of his own beauty more and more interested in the corruption of his own soul he would examine with minute care and sometimes with a monstrous and terrible delight the hideous lines that seared the wrinkling forehead or crawled around the heavy sensual mouth wondering sometimes which were the more horrible the signs of sin or the signs of age he would place his white hands beside the coarse bloated hands of the picture and smile he mocked the misshapen body and the failing limbs there were moments indeed at night 
when lying sleepless in his own delicately scented chamber or in the sordid room of the little ill-famed tavern near the docks which under an assumed name and in disguise it was his habit to frequent he would think of the ruin he had brought upon his soul with a pity that was all the more poignant because it was purely selfish but moments such as these were rare that curiosity about life which lord henry had first stirred in him as they sat together in the garden of their friend seemed to increase with gratification the more he knew the more he desired to know he had mad hungers that grew more ravenous as he fed them yet he was not really reckless at any rate in his relations to society once or twice every month during the winter and on each wednesday evening while the season lasted he would throw open to the world his beautiful house and have the most celebrated musicians of the day to charm his guests with the wonders of their art his little dinners in the settling of which lord henry always assisted him were noted as much for the careful selection and placing of those invited as for the exquisite taste shown in the decoration of the table with its subtle symphonic arrangements of exotic flowers and embroidered cloths and antique plate of gold and silver indeed there were many especially among the very young men who saw or fancied that they saw in dorian gray the true realization of a type of which they had often dreamed in eton or oxford days a type that was to combine something of the real culture of the scholar with all the grace and distinction and perfect manner of a citizen of the world to them he seemed to be of the company of those whom dante describes as having sought to make themselves perfect by the worship of beauty like gautier he was one for whom the visible world existed and certainly to him life itself was the first the greatest of the arts and for it all the other arts seem to be but a preparation fashion by which what is really fantastic becomes for a moment universal and dandyism which in its own way is an attempt to assert the absolute modernity of beauty had of course their fascination for him his mode of dressing and the particular styles that from time to time he affected had their marked influence on the young exquisites of the mayfair balls and pall mall club windows who copied him in everything that he did and tried to reproduce the accidental charm of his graceful though to him only half serious fopperies for while he was but too ready to accept the position that was almost immediately offered to him on his coming of age and found indeed a subtle pleasure in the thought that he might really become to the london of his own day what to imperial neronian rome the author of the satyricon once had been yet in his inmost heart he desired to be something more than a mere arbiter elegantiarum to be consulted on the wearing of a jewel or the knotting of a necktie or the conduct of a cane he sought to elaborate some new scheme of life that would have its reasoned philosophy and its ordered principles and find in the spiritualizing of the senses its highest realization the worship of the senses has often and with much justice been decried men feeling a natural instinct of terror about passions and sensations that seem stronger than themselves and that they are conscious of sharing with the less highly organized forms of existence but it appeared to dorian gray that the true nature of the senses had never been understood 
and that they had remained savage and animal merely because the world had tried to starve them into submission or to kill them by pain instead of aiming at making them elements of a new spirituality of which a fine instinct for beauty was to be the dominant characteristic as he looked back upon man moving through history he was haunted by a feeling of loss so much had been surrendered and to such little purpose there had been mad wilful rejections monstrous forms of self-torture and self-denial whose origin was fear and whose result was a degradation infinitely more terrible than that fancied degradation from which in their ignorance they had sought to escape nature in her wonderful irony driving out the anchorite to feed with the wild animals of the desert and giving to the hermit the beasts of the field as his companions yes there was to be as lord henry had prophesied a new hedonism that was to recreate life and to save it from that harsh uncomely puritanism that is having in our own day its curious revival it was to have its service of the intellect certainly yet it was never to accept any theory or system that would involve the sacrifice of any mode of passionate experience its aim indeed was to be experience itself and not the fruits of experience sweet or bitter as they might be of the asceticism that deadens the senses as of the vulgar profligacy that dulls them it was to know nothing but it was to teach man to concentrate himself upon the moments of a life that is itself but a moment there are few of us who have not sometimes wakened before dawn either after one of those dreamless nights that make us almost enamoured of death or one of those nights of horror and misshapen joy when through the chambers of the brain sweep phantoms more terrible than reality itself and instinct with that vivid life that lurks in all grotesques and that lends to gothic art its enduring vitality this art being one might fancy especially the art of those whose minds have been troubled with the malady of reverie gradually white fingers creep through the curtains and they appear to tremble in black fantastic shapes dumb shadows crawl into the corners of the room and crouch there outside there is the stirring of birds among the leaves or the sound of men going forth to their work or the sigh and sob of the wind coming down from the hills and wandering round the silent house as though it feared to wake the sleepers and yet must needs call forth sleep from her purple cave veil after veil of thin dusky gauze is lifted and by degrees the forms and colours of things are restored to them and we watch the dawn remaking the world in its antique pattern the wan mirrors get back their mimic life the flameless tapers stand where we had left them and beside them lies the half-cut book that we had been studying or the wired flower that we had worn at the ball or the letter that we had been afraid to read or that we had read too often nothing seems to us changed out of the unreal shadows of the night comes back the real life that we had known we have to resume it where we had left off and there steals over us a terrible sense of the necessity for the continuance of energy in the same wearisome round of stereotyped habits or a wild longing it may be that our eyelids might open some morning upon a world that had been refashioned anew in the darkness for our pleasure 
a world in which things would have fresh shapes and colours and be changed or have other secrets a world in which the past would have little or no place or survive at any rate in no conscious form of obligation or regret the remembrance even of joy having its bitterness and the memories of pleasure their pain it was the creation of such worlds as these that seemed to dorian gray to be the true object or amongst the true objects of life and in his search for sensations that would be at once new and delightful and possess that element of strangeness that is so essential to romance he would often adopt certain modes of thought that he knew to be really alien to his nature abandon himself to their subtle influences and then having as it were caught their colour and satisfied his intellectual curiosity leave them with that curious indifference that is not incompatible with a real ardour of temperament and that indeed according to certain modern psychologists is often a condition of it it was rumoured of him once that he was about to join the roman catholic communion and certainly the roman ritual had always a great attraction for him the daily sacrifice more awful really than all the sacrifices of the antique world stirred him as much by its superb rejection of the evidence of the senses as by the primitive simplicity of its elements and the eternal pathos of the human tragedy that it sought to symbolise he loved to kneel down on the cold marble pavement and watch the priest in his stiff flowered dalmatic slowly and with white hands moving aside the veil of the tabernacle or raising aloft the jewelled lantern-shaped monstrance with that pallid wafer that at times one would fain think is indeed the panis celestis the bread of angels or robed in the garments of the passion of christ breaking the host into the chalice and smiting his breast for his sins the fuming censers that the grave boys in their lace and scarlet tossed into the air like great gilt flowers had their subtle fascination for him as he passed out he used to look with wonder at the black confessionals and long to sit in the dim shadow of one of them and listen to men and women whispering through the worn grating the true story of their lives but he never fell into the error of arresting his intellectual development by any formal acceptance of creed or system or of mistaking for a house in which to live an inn that is but suitable for the sojourn of a night or for a few hours of a night in which there are no stars and the moon is in travail mysticism with its marvellous power of making common things strange to us and the subtle antinomianism that always seems to accompany it moved him for a season and for a season he inclined to the materialistic doctrines of the darwinismus movement in germany and found a curious pleasure in tracing the thoughts and passions of men to some pearly cell in the brain or some white nerve in the body delighting in the conception of the absolute dependence of the spirit on certain physical conditions morbid or healthy normal or diseased yet as has been said of him before no theory of life seemed to him to be of any importance compared with life itself he felt keenly conscious of how barren all intellectual speculation is when separated from action and experiment he knew that the senses no less than the soul have their spiritual mysteries to reveal and so he would now study perfumes and the secrets of their manufacture 
distilling heavily scented oils and burning odorous gums from the east he saw that there was no mood of the mind that had not its counterpart in the sensuous life and set himself to discover their true relations wondering what there was in frankincense that made one mystical and in ambergris that stirred one's passions and in violets that woke the memory of dead romances and in musk that troubled the brain and in champak that stained the imagination and seeking often to elaborate a real psychology of perfumes and to estimate the several influences of sweet-smelling roots and scented pollen-laden flowers of aromatic balms and of dark and fragrant woods of spikenard that sickens of hovenia that makes men mad and of aloes that are said to be able to expel melancholy from the soul at another time he devoted himself entirely to music and in a long latticed room with a vermilion and gold ceiling and walls of olive-green lacquer he used to give curious concerts in which mad gypsies tore wild music from little zithers or grave yellow-shawled tunisians plucked at the strained strings of monstrous lutes while grinning negroes beat monotonously upon copper drums and crouching upon scarlet mats slim turbaned indians blew through long pipes of reed or brass and charmed or feigned to charm great hooded snakes and horrible horned adders the harsh intervals and shrill discords of barbaric music stirred him at times when schubert's grace and chopin's beautiful sorrows and the mighty harmonies of beethoven himself fell unheeded on his ear he collected together from all parts of the world the strangest instruments that could be found either in the tombs of dead nations or among the few savage tribes that have survived contact with western civilizations and loved to touch and try them he had the mysterious juru paris of the rio negro indians that women are not allowed to look at and that even youths may not see till they have been subjected to fasting and scourging and the earthen jars of the peruvians that have the shrill cries of birds and flutes of human bones such as alfonso de ovalle heard in chile and the sonorous green jaspers that are found near cusco and give forth a note of singular sweetness he had painted gourds filled with pebbles that rattled when they were shaken the long clarine of the mexicans into which the performer does not blow but through which he inhales the air the harsh ture of the amazon tribes that is sounded by the sentinels who sit all day long in high trees and can be heard it is said at a distance of three leagues the teponastli that has two vibrating tongues of wood and is beaten with sticks that are smeared with an elastic gum obtained from the milky juice of plants the yottle bells of the aztecs that are hung in clusters like grapes and a huge cylindrical drum covered with the skins of great serpents like the one that bernal diaz saw when he went with cortes into the mexican temple and of whose doleful sound he has left us so vivid a description the fantastic character of these instruments fascinated him and he felt a curious delight in the thought that art like nature has her monsters things of bestial shape and with hideous voices yet after some time he wearied of them and would sit in his box at the opera either alone or with lord henry listening in rapt pleasure to tannhauser 
and seeing in the prelude to that great work of art a presentation of the tragedy of his own soul on one occasion he took up the study of jewels and appeared at a costume ball as anne de joyeuse admiral of france in a dress covered with five hundred and sixty pearls this taste enthralled him for years and indeed may be said never to have left him he would often spend a whole day settling and resettling in their cases the various stones that he had collected such as the olive-green chrysoberyl that turns red by lamplight the cymophane with its wire-like line of silver the pistachio-coloured perido rose-pink and wine-yellow topazes carbuncles of fiery scarlet with tremulous four-rayed stars flame-red cinnamon stones orange and violet spinels and amethysts with their alternate layers of ruby and sapphire he loved the red gold of the sunstone and the moonstone's pearly whiteness and the broken rainbow of the milky opal he procured from amsterdam three emeralds of extraordinary size and richness of colour and had a turquoise de la vieille roche that was the envy of all the connoisseurs he discovered wonderful stories also about jewels in alfonso's clericalis disciplina a serpent was mentioned with eyes of real jacinth and in the romantic history of alexander the conqueror of emathia was said to have found in the vale of jordan snakes with collars of real emeralds growing on their back there was a gem in the brain of the dragon philostratus told us and by the exhibition of golden letters and a scarlet robe the monster could be thrown into a magical sleep and slain according to the great alchemist pierre de boniface the diamond rendered a man invisible and the agate of india made him eloquent the cornelian appeased anger and the hyacinth provoked sleep and the amethyst drove away the fumes of wine the garnet cast out demons and the hydropicus deprived the moon of her colour the selenite waxed and waned with the moon and the melosius that discovers thieves could be affected only by the blood of kids leonardus camillus had seen a white stone taken from the brain of a newly killed toad that was a certain antidote against poison the bezoar that was found in the heart of the arabian deer was a charm that could cure the plague in the nests of arabian birds was the aspilates that according to democritus kept the wearer from any danger by fire the king of ceylon rode through his city with a large ruby in his hand at the ceremony of his coronation the gates of the palace of john the priest were made of sardius with the horn of the horned snake inwrought so that no man might bring poison within over the gable were two golden apples in which were two carbuncles so that the gold might shine by day and the carbuncles by night in lodge's strange romance a marguerite of america it was stated that in the chamber of the queen one could behold all the chaste ladies of the world in chaste out of silver looking through fair mirrors of chrysolites carbuncles sapphires and green emeralds marco polo had seen the inhabitants of zipangu place rose-coloured pearls in the mouths of the dead a sea monster had been enamoured of the pearl that the diver brought to king peroses and had slain the thief and mourned for seven moons over its loss when the huns lured the king into the great pit he flung it away procopius tells the story 
nor was it ever found again though the emperor anastasius offered five hundred weight of gold pieces for it the king of malabar had shown to a certain venetian a rosary of three hundred and four pearls one for every god that he worshipped when the duc de valentinois son of alexander the sixth visited louis the twelfth of france his horse was loaded with gold leaves according to brantome and his cap had double rows of rubies that threw out a great light charles of england had ridden in stirrups hung with four hundred and twenty-one diamonds richard the second had a coat valued at thirty thousand marks which was covered with ballas rubies hall described henry the eighth on his way to the tower previous to his coronation as wearing a jacket of raised gold the placard embroidered with diamonds and other rich stones and a great borderick about his neck of large balances the favourites of james the first wore earrings of emerald set in gold filigrane edward the second gave to piers gaveston a suit of red gold armour studded with jacinths a collar of gold roses set with turquoise stones and a skull-cap parsemé with pearls henry the second wore jewelled gloves reaching to the elbow and had a hawk glove sewn with twelve rubies and fifty-two great orients the ducal hat of charles the rash the last duke of burgundy of his race was hung with pear-shaped pearls and studded with sapphires how exquisite life had once been how gorgeous in its pomp and decoration even to read of the luxury of the dead was wonderful end of chapter eleven part one the picture of dorian gray by oscar wilde chapter eleven part two then he turned his attention to embroideries and to the tapestries that performed the office of frescoes in the chill rooms of the northern nations of europe as he investigated the subject and he always had an extraordinary faculty of becoming absolutely absorbed for the moment in whatever he took up he was almost saddened by the reflection of the ruin that time brought on beautiful and wonderful things he at any rate had escaped that summer followed summer and the yellow jonquils bloomed and died many times and nights of horror repeated the story of their shame but he was unchanged no winter marred his face or stained his flower-like bloom how different it was with material things where had they passed to where was the great crocus-coloured robe on which the gods fought against the giants that had been worked by brown girls for the pleasure of athena where the huge valerium that nero had stretched across the Colosseum at rome that titan sail of purple on which was represented the starry sky and apollo driving a chariot drawn by white gilt-reined steeds he longed to see the curious table napkins wrought for the priest of the sun on which were displayed all the dainties and viands that could be wanted for a feast the mortuary cloth of king chilperic with its three hundred golden bees the fantastic robes that excited the indignation of the bishop of pontus and were figured with lions panthers bears dogs forests rocks hunters all in fact that a painter can copy from nature and the coat that charles of orleans once wore 
on the sleeves of which were embroidered the verses of a song beginning madame je suis tout joyeux the musical accompaniment of the words being wrought in gold thread and each note of square shape in those days formed with four pearls he read of the room that was prepared at the palace at rheims for the use of queen joan of burgundy and was decorated with thirteen hundred and twenty-one parrots made in broidery and blazoned with the king's arms and five hundred and sixty-one butterflies whose wings were similarly ornamented with the arms of the queen the whole worked in gold catherine de medicis had a mourning bed made for her of black velvet powdered with crescents and suns its curtains were of damask with leafy wreaths and garlands figured upon a gold and silver ground and fringed along the edges with broideries of pearls and it stood in a room hung with rows of the queen's devices in cut black velvet upon cloth of silver louis the fourteenth had gold embroidered caryatids fifteen feet high in his apartment the state bed of sobieski king of poland was made of smyrna gold brocade embroidered in turquoises with verses from the koran its supports were of silver gilt, beautifully chased, and profusely set with enamelled and jewelled medallions. It had been taken from the Turkish camp before Vienna, and the standard of Mohammed had stood beneath the tremulous gilt of its canopy. And so, for a whole year, he sought to accumulate the most exquisite specimens that he could find of textile and embroidered work, getting the dainty Delhi muslins, finely wrought with gold thread palmates, and stitched over with iridescent beetles' wings, the Dhaka gauzes, that from their transparency are known in the East as woven air and running water and evening dew strange figured cloths from java elaborate yellow chinese hangings books bound in tawny satins or fair blue silks and wrought with fleur-de-lis birds and images veils of lassie worked in hungary point sicilian brocades and stiff spanish velvets Georgian work with its gilt coins, and Japanese fukusas with their green-toned golds and their marvellously plumaged birds. He had a special passion also for ecclesiastical vestments, as indeed he had for everything connected with the service of the church. In the long cedar chests that lined the west gallery of his house, he had stored away many rare and beautiful specimens of what is really the raiment of the bride of christ who must wear purple and jewels and fine linen that she may hide the pallid macerated body that is worn by the suffering that she seeks for and wounded by self-inflicted pain he possessed a gorgeous cope of crimson silk and gold thread damask, figured with a repeating pattern of golden pomegranates set in six-petalled formal blossoms, beyond which on either side was the pineapple device wrought in seed pearls. The orphreys were divided into panels representing scenes from the life of the Virgin and the coronation of the Virgin was figured in coloured silks upon the hood. This was Italian work of the fifteenth century. Another cope was of green velvet, embroidered with heart-shaped groups of acanthus leaves, from which spread long-stemmed white blossoms, the details of which were picked out with silver thread and coloured crystals. The morse bore a seraph's head in gold thread raised work. The orphreys were woven in a diaper of red and gold silk, and were starred with medallions of many saints and martyrs, 
among whom was Saint Sebastian. He had chasubles also of amber-coloured silk, and blue silk and gold brocade, and yellow silk damask and cloth of gold, figured with representations of the passion and crucifixion of Christ, and embroidered with lions and peacocks and other emblems, dalmatics of white satin and pink silk damask, decorated with tulips and dolphins and fleur-de-lis, altar frontals of crimson velvet and blue linen, and many corporals, chalice-veils and suderia, in the mystic offices to which such things were put, there was something that quickened his imagination. For these treasures, and everything that he collected in his lovely house, were to be to him means of forgetfulness, modes by which he could escape, for a season, from the fear that seemed to him at times to be almost too great to be borne upon the walls of the lonely locked room where he had spent so much of his boyhood he had hung with his own hands the terrible portrait whose changing features showed him the real degradation of his life and in front of it had draped the purple and gold pall as a curtain for weeks he would not go there would forget the hideous painted thing and get back his light heart, his wonderful joyousness, his passionate absorption in mere existence. Then suddenly, some night, he would creep out of the house, go down to dreadful places near Bluegate Fields, and stay there day after day until he was driven away. On his return, he would sit in front of the picture, sometimes loathing it and himself, but filled at other times with that pride of individualism that is half the fascination of sin, and smiling with secret pleasure at the misshapen shadow that had to bear the burden that should have been his own. After a few years he could not endure to be long out of England, and gave up the villa that he had shared at Trouville with Lord Henry, as well as the little white walled-in house at Algiers, where they had more than once spent the winter. He hated to be separated from the picture that was such a part of his life, and was also afraid that during his absence someone might gain access to the room, in spite of the elaborate bars that he had caused to be placed upon the door. He was quite conscious that this would tell them nothing. It was true that the portrait still preserved, under all the foulness and ugliness of the face, its marked likeness to himself. But what could they learn from that? He would laugh at any one who tried to taunt him. He had not painted it. What was it to him how vile and full of shame it looked? Even if he told them, would they believe it? Yet he was afraid. Sometimes when he was down at his great house in Nottinghamshire, entertaining the fashionable young men of his own rank, who were his chief companions, and astounding the county by the wanton luxury and gorgeous splendour of his mode of life, he would suddenly leave his guests, and rush back to town, to see that the door had not been tampered with, and that the picture was still there. What if it should be stolen? The mere thought made him cold with horror. Surely the world would know his secret then. Perhaps the world already suspected it. For while he fascinated many, there were not a few who distrusted him. He was very nearly blackballed at a West End club, of which his birth and social position fully entitled him to become a member. And it was said that on one occasion, when he was brought by a friend into the smoking-room of the Churchill, the Duke of Berwick and another gentleman got up in a marked manner and went out. 
curious stories became current about him after he had passed his twenty-fifth year it was rumoured that he had been seen brawling with foreign sailors in a low den in the distant parts of whitechapel and that he consorted with thieves and coiners and knew the mysteries of their trade his extraordinary absences became notorious and when he used to reappear again in society men would whisper to each other in corners or pass him with a sneer or look at him with cold searching eyes as though they were determined to discover his secret of such insolences and attempted slights he of course took no notice and in the opinion of most people his frank debonair manner his charming boyish smile and the infinite grace of that wonderful youth that seemed never to leave him were in themselves a sufficient answer to the calumnies for so they termed them that were circulated about him it was remarked however that some of those who had been most intimate with him appeared after a time to shun him women who had wildly adored him and for his sake had braved all social censure and set convention at defiance were seen to grow pallid with shame or horror if dorian gray entered the room yet these whispered scandals only increased in the eyes of many his strange and dangerous charm his great wealth was a certain element of security society civilized society at least is never very ready to believe anything to the detriment of those who are both rich and fascinating it feels instinctively that manners are of more importance than morals and in its opinion the highest respectability is of much less value than the possession of a good chef and after all it is a very poor consolation to be told that the man who has given one a bad dinner or poor wine is irreproachable in his private life even the cardinal virtues cannot atone for half-cold entrees as lord henry remarked once in a discussion on the subject and there is possibly a good deal to be said for his view for the canons of good society are or should be the same as the canons of art form is absolutely essential to it it should have the dignity of a ceremony as well as its unreality and should combine the insincere character of a romantic play with the wit and beauty that make such plays delightful to us is insincerity such a terrible thing i think not it is merely a method by which we can multiply our personalities such at any rate was dorian gray's opinion he used to wonder at the shallow psychology of those who conceive the ego in man as a thing simple permanent reliable and of one essence to him man was a being with myriad lives and myriad sensations a complex multiform creature that bore within itself strange legacies of thought and passion and whose very flesh was tainted with the monstrous maladies of the dead he loved to stroll through the gaunt cold picture gallery of his country house and look at the various portraits of those whose blood flowed in his veins here was philip harbert described by francis osborne in his memoirs on the reigns of queen elizabeth and king james as one who was caressed by the court for his handsome face which kept him not long company was it young harbert's life that he sometimes led had some strange poisonous germ crept from body to body till it had reached his own 
was it some dim sense of that ruined grace that had made him so suddenly and almost without cause give utterance in basil hallward's studio to the mad prayer that had so changed his life here in gold-embroidered red doublet jewelled surcoat and gilt-edged ruff and wristbands stood sir anthony sherard with his silver and black armour piled at his feet what had this man's legacy been had the lover of giovanna of naples bequeathed him some inheritance of sin and shame were his own actions merely the dreams that the dead man had not dared to realise here from the fading canvas smiled lady elizabeth Deverer, in her gauze hood pearl stomacher and pink slashed sleeves a flower was in her right hand and her left clasped an enamelled collar of white and damask roses on a table by her side lay a mandolin and an apple there were large green rosettes upon her little pointed shoes he knew her life and the strange stories that were told about her lovers had he something of her temperament in him these oval heavy-lidded eyes seemed to look curiously at him what of george willoughby with his powdered hair and fantastic patches how evil he looked the face was saturnine and swarthy and the sensual lips seemed to be twisted with disdain delicate lace ruffles fell over the lean yellow hands that were so overladen with rings he had been a macaroni of the eighteenth century and the friend in his youth of lord ferrers what of the second lord beckenham the companion of the prince regent in his wildest days and one of the witnesses at the secret marriage with mrs fitzherbert how proud and handsome he was with his chestnut curls and insolent pose what passions had he bequeathed the world had looked upon him as infamous he had led the orgies at carlton house the star of the garter glittered upon his breast beside him hung the portrait of his wife a pallid thin-lipped woman in black her blood also stirred within him how curious it all seemed and his mother with her lady hamilton face and her moist wine-dashed lips he knew what he had got from her he had got from her his beauty and his passion for the beauty of others she laughed at him in her loose bacante dress there were vine leaves in her hair the purple spilled from the cup she was holding the carnations of the painting had withered but the eyes were still wonderful in their depth and brilliancy of colour they seemed to follow him wherever he went yet one had ancestors in literature as well as in one's own race nearer perhaps in type and temperament many of them and certainly with an influence of which one was more absolutely conscious there were times when it appeared to dorian gray that the whole of history was merely the record of his own life not as he had lived it in act and circumstance but as his imagination had created it for him as it had been in his brain and in his passions he felt that he had known them all those strange terrible figures that had passed across the stage of the world and made sin so marvellous and evil so full of subtlety it seemed to him that in some mysterious way their lives had been his own the hero of the wonderful novel that had so influenced his life had himself known this curious fancy in the seventh chapter he tells how crowned with laurel lest lightning might strike him he had sat as tiberius in a garden at capri reading the shameful books of elephantis 
while dwarfs and peacocks strutted round him and the flute-player mocked the swinger of the censer and as caligula had caroused with the green-shirted jockeys in their stables and supped in an ivory manger with a jewel-frontleted horse and as domitian had wandered through a corridor lined with marble mirrors looking round with haggard eyes for the reflection of the dagger that was to end his days and sick with that ennui that terrible tidium vitae that comes on those to whom life denies nothing and had peered through a clear emerald at the red shambles of the circus and then in a litter of pearl and purple drawn by silver-shod mules been carried through the street of pomegranates to a house of gold and heard men cry on nero caesar as he passed by and as elagabalus had painted his face with colours and plied the distaff among the women and brought the moon from carthage and given her in mystic marriage to the sun over and over again dorian used to read this fantastic chapter and the two chapters immediately following in which as in some curious tapestries or cunningly wrought enamels were pictured the awful and beautiful forms of those whom vice and blood and weariness had made monstrous or mad filippo duke of milan who slew his wife and painted her lips with a scarlet poison that her lover might suck death from the dead thing he fondled pietro barbi the venetian known as paul the second who sought in his vanity to assume the title of formosus and whose tiara valued at two hundred thousand florins was bought at the price of a terrible sin Gian Maria Visconti, who used hounds to chase living men, and whose murdered body was covered with roses by a harlot who had loved him. The Borgia on his white horse, with fratricide riding beside him, and his mantle stained with the blood of Perotto. Pietro Riario, the young cardinal archbishop of Florence, child and minion of sixtus the fourth whose beauty was equalled only by his debauchery and who received leonora of aragon in a pavilion of white and crimson silk filled with nymphs and centaurs and gilded a boy that he might serve at the feast as ganymede or hylas et Celine, whose melancholy could be cured only by the spectacle of death and who had a passion for red blood as other men have for red wine the son of the fiend as was reported and one who had cheated his father at dice when gambling with him for his own soul giambattista cibo who in mockery took the name of innocent and into whose torpid veins the blood of three lads was infused by a jewish doctor sigismondo malatesta the lover of isotta and the lord of rimini whose effigy was burned at rome as the enemy of god and man who strangled polysena with a napkin and gave poison to ginevra d'este in a cup of emerald and in honour of a shameful passion built a pagan church for christian worship charles the sixth who had so wildly adored his brother's wife that a leper had warned him of the insanity that was coming on him and who when his brain had sickened and grown strange could only be soothed by saracen cards painted with the images of love and death and madness and in his trimmed jerkin and jewelled cap and acanthus like curls grifonetto baglioni who slew astorre with his bride and simonetto with his page and whose comeliness was such that as he lay dying in the yellow piazza of perugia 
those who had hated him could not choose but weep and atalanta who had cursed him blessed him there was a horrible fascination in them all he saw them at night and they troubled his imagination in the day the renaissance knew of strange manners of poisoning poisoning by a helmet and a lighted torch by an embroidered glove and a jewelled fan by a gilded pomander and by an amber chain dorian gray had been poisoned by a book there were moments when he looked on evil simply as a mode through which he could realize his conception of the beautiful end of chapter eleven the picture of dorian gray by oscar wilde chapter twelve it was on the ninth of november the eve of his own thirty-eighth birthday as he often remembered afterwards he was walking home about eleven o'clock from lord henry's where he had been dining and was wrapped in heavy furs as the night was cold and foggy at the corner of grosvenor square and south audley street a man passed him in the mist walking very fast and with the collar of his grey ulster turned up he had a bag in his hand dorian recognized him it was basil hallward a strange sense of fear for which he could not account came over him he made no sign of recognition and went on quickly in the direction of his own house but hallward had seen him dorian heard him first stopping on the pavement and then hurrying after him in a few moments his hand was on his arm dorian what an extraordinary piece of luck i have been waiting for you in your library ever since nine o'clock finally i took pity on your tired servant and told him to go to bed as he let me out i am off to paris by the midnight train and i particularly wanted to see you before i left i thought it was you or rather your fur coat as you passed me but i wasn't quite sure didn't you recognize me in this fog my dear basil why i can't even recognize grosvenor square i believe my house is somewhere about here but i don't feel at all certain about it i am sorry you are going away as i have not seen you for ages but i suppose you will be back soon no i am going to be out of england for six months i intend to take a studio in paris and shut myself up till i have finished a great picture i have in my head however it wasn't about myself i wanted to talk here we are at your door let me come in for a moment i have something to say to you i shall be charmed but won't you miss your train said dorian gray languidly as he passed up the steps and opened the door with his latch-key the lamplight struggled out through the fog and hallward looked at his watch i have heaps of time he answered the train doesn't go till twelve fifteen and it is only just eleven in fact i was on my way to the club to look for you when i met you you see i shan't have any delay about luggage as i have sent on my heavy things all i have with me is in this bag and i can easily get to victoria in twenty minutes dorian looked at him and smiled what a way for a fashionable painter to travel a gladstone bag and an ulster come in or the fog will get into the house and mind you don't talk about anything serious nothing is serious nowadays at least nothing should be hallward shook his head as he entered and followed dorian into the library there was a bright wood fire blazing in the large open hearth the lamps were lit and an open dutch silver spirit case stood with some siphons of soda water and large cut glass tumblers on a little marquetry table you see your servant made me quite at home dorian he gave me everything i wanted including your best gold-tipped cigarettes he is a most hospitable creature i like him much better than the frenchman you used to have what has become of the frenchman by and by dorian shrugged his shoulders i believe he married lady radley's maid and has established her in paris as an english dressmaker anglomania is very fashionable over there now i hear 
It seems silly of the French, doesn't it? But, do you know, he was not at all a bad servant. I never liked him, but I had nothing to complain about. One often imagines things that are quite absurd. He was really very devoted to me, and seemed quite sorry when he went away. Have another brandy and soda? Or would you like hock and seltzer? I always take hock and seltzer myself. There are sure to be some in the next room. Thanks. I won't have anything more, said the painter, taking his cap and coat off, and throwing them on the bag that he had placed in the corner. And now, my dear fellow, I want to speak to you seriously. Don't frown like that. You make it so much more difficult for me. What is it all about? cried Dorian, in his petulant way, flinging himself down on the sofa. I hope it is not about myself. I am tired of myself tonight. I should like to be somebody else. It is about yourself, answered Hallward, in his grave, deep voice. And I must say it to you. I shall only keep half an hour. Dorian sighed and lit a cigarette. Half an hour, he murmured. It is not much to ask of you, Dorian, and it is entirely for your own sake that I am speaking. I think it right that you should know that the most dreadful things are being said against you in London. I don't wish to know anything about them. I love scandals about other people. But scandals about myself don't interest me. They have not got the charm of novelty. They must interest you, Dorian. Every gentleman is interested in his good name. You don't want people to talk of you as something vile and degraded. Of course you have your position and your wealth and all that kind of thing. But position and wealth are not everything. Mind you, I don't believe these rumors at all. At least I can't believe them when I see you. Sin is a thing that writes itself across a man's face. It cannot be concealed. People talk sometimes of secret vices. There are no such things. If a wretched man has a vice, it shows itself in the lines of his mouth, the droop of his eyelids, the molding of his hands even. Somebody, I won't mention his name, but you know him, came to me last year to have his portrait done. I had never seen him before and had never heard anything about him at the time, though I have heard a good deal since. He offered an extravagant price. I refused him. There was something in the shape of his fingers that I hated. I know now that I was quite right in what I fancied about him. His life is dreadful. But you, Dorian, with your pure, bright, innocent face and your marvellous, untroubled youth, I can't believe anything against you. And yet I see you very seldom, and you never come down to the studio now. And when I am away from you and I hear all these hideous things that people are whispering about you, I don't know what to say. Why is it, Dorian, that a man like the Duke of Berwick leaves the room of a club when you enter it? Why is it that so many gentlemen in London will neither go to your house or invite you to theirs? You used to be a friend of Lord Staveley. I met him at dinner last week. Your name happened to come up in conversation, in connection with the miniatures you have lent to the exhibition at Dudley. Staveley curled his lip and said that you might have the most artistic tastes, but that you were a man whom no pure-minded girl should be allowed to know, and whom no chaste woman should sit in the same room with. I reminded him that I was a friend of yours and asked him what he meant. He told me. He told me right out before everybody. It was horrible. Why is your friendship so fatal to young men? There was that wretched boy in the guards who committed suicide. You were his great friend. There was Sir Henry Ashton who had to leave England with a tarnished name. You and he were inseparable. What about Adrian Singleton and his dreadful end? What about Lord Kent's only son in his career? I met his father yesterday in St. James Street. He seemed broken with shame and sorrow. What about the young Duke of Perth? What sort of life has he got now? What gentleman would associate with him? Stop, Basil. You are talking about things of which you know nothing, said Dorian Gray, biting his lip and with a note of infinite contempt in his voice. You ask me why Berwick leaves a room when I enter it? It is because I know everything about his life, not because he knows anything about mine. With such blood as he has in his veins, how could his record be clean? You ask me about Henry Ashton and young Perth? Did I teach the one his vices, and the other his debauchery? If Kent's silly son takes his wife from the streets, what is that to me? 
If Adrian Singleton writes his friend's name across a bill, am I his keeper? I know how people chatter in England. The middle classes air their moral prejudices over their gross dinner tables, and whisper about what they call the profligacies of their betters, in order to try and pretend they are in smart society, and on intimate terms with the people they slander. In this country it is enough for a man to have distinction and brains for every common tongue to wag against him. And what sort of lives do these people, who pose as being moral, lead themselves? My dear fellow, you forget that we are in the native land of the hypocrite. Dorian, cried Hallward, that is not the question. England is bad enough, I know, and English society is all wrong. That is the reason why I want you to be fine. You have not been fine. One has the right to judge of a man by the effect he has over his friends. Yours seems to lose all sense of honor, of goodness, of purity. You have filled them with a madness for pleasure. They have gone down in the depths. You led them there. Yes, you led them there. And yet you can smile as you are smiling now. And there is worse behind. I know you and Harry are inseparable. Surely for that reason, if for no other, you should not have made his sister's name a byword. Take care, Basil. You go too far. I must speak, and you must listen. You shall listen. When you met Lady Gwendolen, not a breath of scandal had ever touched her. Is there a single decent woman in London now who would drive with her in the park? Why, even her children are not allowed to live with her. Then there are other stories. Stories that you have been seen creeping at dawn out of dreadful houses and slinking in disguise into the foulest dens in London. Are they true? Can they be true? When I first heard them, I laughed. I hear them now, and they make me shudder. What about your country house and the life that is led there? Dorian, you don't know what is said about you. I won't tell you that I don't want to preach to you. I remember Harry saying once that every man who turned himself into an amateur curate for the moment always began by saying that, and then proceeded to break his word. I do want to preach to you. I want you to lead such a life as will make the world respect you. I want you to have a clean name and a fair record. I want you to get rid of the dreadful people you associate with. Don't shrug your shoulders like that. Don't be so indifferent. You have a wonderful influence. You let it be for good, not for evil. They say that you corrupt everyone with whom you become intimate, and that it is quite sufficient for you to enter a house for shame of some kind to follow after. I don't know whether it is so or not. How should I know? But it is said of you, I am told things that it seems impossible to doubt. Lord Gloucester was one of my greatest friends at Oxford. He showed me a letter that his wife had written to him when she was dying alone in her villa at Mentone. Your name was implicated in the most terrible confession I ever read. I told him that it was absurd, that I knew you thoroughly, and that you were incapable of anything of the kind. Know you? I wonder, do I know you? Before I could answer that, I should have to see your soul. To see my soul? muttered Dorian Gray, starting up from the sofa, and turning almost white from fear. Yes, answered Hallward gravely, and with deep-toned sorrow in his voice. To see your soul, but only God can do that. A bitter laugh of mockery broke from the lips of the younger man. <laughs> you shall see it yourself to-night he cried, seizing a lamp from the table. Come, it is your own handiwork. Why shouldn't you look at it? You can tell the world all about it afterwards, if you choose. Nobody would believe you. If they did believe you, they would like me all the better for it. I know the age better than you do, though you will prate about it so tediously. Come, I tell you, you have chatted enough about corruption. Now you shall look on it face to face. There was the madness of pride in every word he uttered. He stamped his foot upon the ground in his boyish, insolent manner. He felt a terrible joy at the thought that someone else was to share his secret, and that the man who had painted the portrait that was the origin of all his shame was to be burdened for the rest of his life with the hideous memory of what he had done. Yes, 
he continued coming closer to him and looking steadfastly into his stern eyes i shall show you my soul you shall see the thing that you fancy only god can see hallward started back this is blasphemy dorian he cried you must not say things like that they are horrible and they don't mean anything you think so he laughed again i know so as for what i said to you tonight i said it for your good you know i have always been a staunch friend to you don't touch me finish what you have to say a twisted flash of pain shot across the painter's face he paused for a moment and a wild feeling of pity came over him after all what right had he to pry into the life of dorian gray if he had done a tithe of what was rumoured about him how much he must have suffered then he straightened himself up and walked over to the fireplace and stood there looking at the burning logs with their frost-like ashes and their throbbing cores of flame i am waiting basil said the young man in a hard clear voice he turned round what i have to say is this he cried you must give me some answer to these horrible charges that i made against you if you tell me they are absolutely untrue from beginning to end i shall believe you deny them dorian deny them can't you see what i am going through my god don't tell me that you are bad and corrupt and shameful dorian gray smiled there was a curl of contempt in his lips come upstairs basil he said quietly i keep a diary of my life from day to day and it never leaves the room in which it is written i shall show it to you if you come with me i shall come with you dorian if you wish it i see i have missed my train that makes no matter i can go to-morrow but don't ask me to read anything to-night all i want is a plain answer to my question that shall be given to you upstairs i could not give it here you will not have to read long end of chapter twelve the picture of dorian gray by oscar wilde chapter thirteen he passed out of the room and began the ascent basil hallward following close behind they walked softly as men do instinctively at night the lamp cast fantastic shadows on the wall and staircase a rising wind made some of the windows rattle when they reached the top landing dorian set the lamp down on the floor and taking out the key turned it in the lock you insist on knowing basil he asked in a low voice yes i am delighted he answered smiling then he added somewhat harshly you are the one man in the world who is entitled to know everything about me you have had more to do with my life than you think and taking up the lamp he opened the door and went in a cold current of air passed them and the light shot up for a moment in a flame of murky orange he shuddered shut the door behind you he whispered as he placed the lamp on the table hallward glanced round him with a puzzled expression the room looked as if it had not been lived in for years a faded flemish tapestry a curtained picture an old italian cassone and an almost empty bookcase that was all that it seemed to contain besides a chair and a table as dorian gray was lighting a half-burned candle that was standing on the mantel-shelf he saw that the whole place was covered with dust and that the carpet was in holes a mouse ran scuffling behind the wainscoting there was a damp odour of mildew so you think that it is only god who sees the soul basil draw that curtain back and you will see mine the voice that spoke was cold and cruel you are mad dorian or playing a part muttered hallward frowning you won't then i must do it myself said the young man and he tore the curtain from its rod and flung it on the ground 
an exclamation of horror broke from the painter's lips as he saw in the dim light the hideous face on the canvas grinning at him there was something in its expression that filled him with disgust and loathing good heavens it was dorian gray's own face that he was looking at the horror whatever it was had not yet entirely spoiled that marvellous beauty there was still some gold in the thinning hair and some scarlet on the sensual mouth the sodden eyes had kept something of the loveliness of their blue the noble curves had not yet completely passed away from chiselled nostrils and from plastic throat yes it was dorian himself but who had done it he seemed to recognize his own brushwork and the frame was his own design the idea was monstrous yet he felt afraid he seized the lighted candle and held it to the picture in the left-hand corner was his own name traced in long letters of bright vermilion it was some foul parody some infamous ignoble satire he had never done that still it was his own picture he knew it and he felt as if his blood had changed in a moment from fire to sluggish ice his own picture what did it mean why had it altered he turned and looked at dorian gray with the eyes of a sick man his mouth twitched and his parched tongue seemed unable to articulate he passed his hand across his forehead it was dank with clammy sweat the young man was leaning against the mantel-shelf watching him with that strange expression that one sees on the faces of those who are absorbed in a play when some great artist is acting there was neither real sorrow in it nor real joy there was simply the passion of the spectator with perhaps a flicker of triumph in his eyes he had taken the flower out of his coat and was smelling it or pretending to do so what does this mean cried hallward at last his own voice sounded shrill and curious in his ears years ago when i was a boy said dorian gray crushing the flower in his hand you met me flattered me and taught me to be vain of my good looks one day you introduced me to a friend of yours who explained to me the wonder of youth and you finished a portrait of me that revealed to me the wonder of beauty in a mad moment that even now i don't know whether i regret or not i made a wish perhaps you would call it a prayer i remember it oh well i remember it no the thing is impossible the room is damp mildew has gotten into the canvas the paints I used had some wretched mineral poison in them. I tell you, the thing is impossible. Ah, what is impossible? murmured the young man, going over to the window and leaning his forehead against the cold, mist-stained glass. You told me you had destroyed it. I was wrong. It has destroyed me. I don't believe it is my picture. Can't you see your ideal in it? said Dorian bitterly. My ideal, as you call it as you called it there was nothing evil in it nothing shameful you were to me such an ideal as i shall never meet again this is the face of a satyr it is the face of my soul christ what a thing i must have worshipped it has the eyes of a devil each of us has heaven and hell in him basil cried dorian with a wild gesture of despair hallward turned again to the portrait and gazed at it my god if it is true he exclaimed and this is what you have done with your life why you must be worse even than those who talk against you fancy to be he held the light up again to the canvas and examined it the surface seemed to be quite undisturbed and as he had left it it was from within apparently that the foulness and horror had come 
through some strange quickening of inner life the leprosies of sin were slowly eating the thing away the rotting of a corpse in a watery grave was not so fearful his hand shook and the candle fell from its socket on the floor and lay there sputtering he placed his foot on it and put it out then he flung himself into the rickety chair that was standing by the table and buried his face in his hands good god dorian what a lesson what an awful lesson there was no answer but he could hear the young man sobbing at the window pray dorian pray he murmured what is it that one was taught to say in one's boyhood lead us not into temptation forgive us our sins wash away our iniquities let us say that together the prayer of your pride has been answered the prayer of your repentance will be answered also i worshipped you too much i am punished for it you worshipped yourself too much we are both punished dorian gray turned slowly around and looked at him with tear-dimmed eyes it is too late basil he faltered it is never too late dorian let us kneel down and try if we cannot remember a prayer isn't there a verse somewhere though your sins be as scarlet yet i will make them as white as snow those words mean nothing to me now hush don't say that you have done enough evil in your life my god don't you see that accursed thing leering at us dorian gray glanced at the picture and suddenly an uncontrollable feeling of hatred for basil hallward came over him as though it had been suggested to him by the image on the canvas whispered into his ear by those grinning lips the mad passions of a hunted animal stirred within him and he loathed the man who was seated at the table more than in his whole life he had ever loathed anything he glanced wildly around something glimmered on the top of the painted chest that faced him his eye fell on it he knew what it was it was a knife that he had brought up some days before to cut a piece of cord and had forgotten to take away with him he moved slowly towards it passing hallward as he did so as soon as he got behind him he seized it and turned round hallward stirred in his chair as if he was going to rise he rushed at him and dug the knife into the great vein that is behind the ear crushing the man's head down on the table and stabbing again and again there was a stifled groan and the horrible sound of someone choking with blood three times the outstretched arms shot up convulsively waving grotesque stiff-fingered hands in the air he stabbed him twice more but the man did not move something began to trickle on the floor he waited for a moment still pressing the head down then he threw the knife on the table and listened he could hear nothing but the drip drip on the threadbare carpet he opened the door and went out on the landing the house was absolutely quiet no one was about for a few seconds he stood bending over the balustrade and peering down into the black seething well of darkness then he took out the key and returned to the room locking himself in as he did so the thing was still seated in the chair straining over the table with bowed head and humped back and long fantastic arms had it not been for the red jagged tear in the neck and the clotted black pool that was slowly widening on the table one would have said that the man was simply asleep how quickly it had all been done he felt strangely calm and walking over to the window opened it and stepped out on the balcony 
the wind had blown the fog away and the sky was like a monstrous peacock's tail starred with myriads of golden eyes he looked down and saw the policeman going his rounds and flashing the long beam of his lantern on the doors of the silent houses the crimson spot of a prowling hansom gleamed at the corner and then vanished a woman in a fluttering shawl was creeping slowly by the railings staggering as she went now and then she stopped and peered back once she began to sing in a hoarse voice the policeman strolled over and said something to her she stumbled away laughing a bitter blast swept across the square the gas lamps flickered and became blue and the leafless trees shook their black iron branches to and fro he shivered and went back closing the window behind him having reached the door he turned the key and opened it he did not even glance at the murdered man he felt that the secret of the whole thing was not to realize the situation the friend who had painted the fatal portrait to which all his misery had been due had gone out of his life that was enough then he remembered the lamp it was a rather curious one of moorish workmanship made of dull silver inlaid with arabesques of burnished steel and studded with coarse turquoises perhaps it might be missed by the servant and questions would be asked he hesitated for a moment then he turned back and took it from the table he could not help seeing the dead thing how still it was how horribly white the long hands looked it was like a dreadful wax image having locked the door behind him he crept quietly downstairs the woodwork creaked and seemed to cry out as if in pain he stopped several times and waited no everything was still it was merely the sound of his own footsteps when he reached the library he saw the bag and coat in the corner they must be hidden away somewhere he unlocked a secret press that was in the wainscoting a press in which he kept his own curious disguises and put them into it he could easily burn them afterwards then he pulled out his watch it was twenty minutes to two he sat down and began to think every year every month almost men were strangled in england for what he had done there had been a madness of murder in the air some red star had come too close to the earth and yet what evidence was there against him basil hallward had left the house at eleven no one had seen him come in again most of the servants were at selby royal his valet had gone to bed paris yes it was to paris that basil had gone and by the midnight train as he had intended with his curious reserved habits it would be months before any suspicions would be roused months everything could be destroyed long before then a sudden thought struck him he put on his fur coat and hat and went out into the hall there he paused hearing the slow heavy tread of the policeman on the pavement outside and seeing the flash of the bull's eye reflected in the window he waited and held his breath after a few moments he drew back the latch and slipped out shutting the door very gently behind him then he began ringing the bell in about five minutes his valet appeared half dressed and looking very drowsy i'm sorry to have had to wake you francis he said stepping in but i had forgotten my latch-key 
What time is it? Ten minutes past two, sir, answered the man, looking at the clock and blinking. Ten minutes past two? How horribly late. You must wake me at nine tomorrow. I have some work to do. All right, sir. Did anyone call this evening? Mr. Hallward, sir. He stayed here till eleven, and then he went away to catch his train. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see him. Did he leave any message? No, sir, except that he would write to you from Paris if he did not find you at the club. That will do, Francis. Don't forget to call me at nine tomorrow. No, sir. The man shambled down the passage in his slippers. Dorian Gray threw his hat and coat upon the table and passed into the library. For a quarter of an hour he walked up and down the room, biting his lip and thinking. Then he took down the blue book from one of the shelves and began to turn over the leaves. Alan Campbell, 152 Hartford Street, Mayfair. Yes, that was the man he wanted. End of chapter 13 The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde Chapter 14 At nine o'clock the next morning, his servant came in with a cup of chocolate on a tray, and opened the shutters. Dorian was sleeping quite peacefully, lying on his right side, with one hand underneath his cheek. He looked like a boy who had been tired out with play or study. The man had to touch him twice on the shoulder before he woke, and as he opened his eyes, a faint smile passed across his lips, as though he had been lost in some delightful dream. Yet he had not dreamed at all. His night had been untroubled by any images of pleasure or of pain. But youth smiles without any reason. It is one of its chiefest charms. He turned round, and leaning upon his elbow, began to sip his chocolate. The mellow November sun came streaming into the room. The sky was bright, and there was a genial warmth in the air. It was almost like a morning in May. Gradually the events of the preceding night crept with silent, blood-stained feet into his brain, and reconstructed themselves there with terrible distinctness. He winced at the memory of all that he had suffered, and for a moment the same curious feeling of loathing for Basil Hallward that had made him kill him as he sat in the chair came back to him, and he grew cold with passion. The dead man was still sitting there too, and in the sunlight now. How horrible that was! Such hideous things were for the darkness, not for the day. He felt that if he brooded on what he had gone through, he would sicken or grow mad. There were sins whose fascination was more in the memory than in the doing of them, strange triumphs that gratified the pride more than the passions, and gave to the intellect a quickened sense of joy, greater than any joy they brought or could ever bring to the senses. But this was not one of them. It was a thing to be driven out of the mind, to be drugged with poppies, to be strangled lest it might strangle one itself. When the half-hour struck, he passed his hand across his forehead, and then got up hastily and dressed himself with even more than his usual care giving a great deal of attention to the choice of his necktie and scarf-pin, and changing his rings more than once. He spent a long time also over breakfast, tasting the various dishes, talking to his valet about some new liveries that he was thinking of getting made for the servants at Selby, and going through his correspondence. At some of the letters he smiled. Three of them bored him. 
one he read several times over and then tore up with a slight look of annoyance in his face that awful thing a woman's memory as lord henry had once said after he had drunk his cup of black coffee he wiped his lips slowly with a napkin motioned to his servant to wait and going over to the table sat down and wrote two letters one he put in his pocket the other he handed to the valet take this round to one fifty two hartford street francis and if mr campbell is out of town get his address as soon as he was alone he lit a cigarette and began sketching upon a piece of paper drawing first flowers and bits of architecture and then human faces suddenly he remarked that every face that he drew seemed to have a fantastic likeness to basil hallward he frowned and getting up went over to the bookcase and took out a volume at hazard he was determined that he would not think about what had happened until it became absolutely necessary that he should do so when he had stretched himself on the sofa he looked at the title page of the book it was gautier's imo et Camé, charpentier's japanese paper edition with the jacquemart etching the binding was of citron green leather with a design of gilt trellis work and dotted pomegranates it had been given to him by adrian singleton as he turned over the pages his eye fell on the poem about the hand of lacenaire the cold yellow hand du supplice encore mal lavé with its downy red hairs and its doigts de faune he glanced at his own white taper fingers shuddering slightly in spite of himself and passed on till he came to those lovely stanzas upon venice sur une gamme chromatique le sein de perles ruisselant la vénus de l'adriatique sort de l'eau son corps rose et blanc les dômes sur l'azur des andes suivant la phrase au pur contour s'enflent comme des gorges rondes que soulève un soupir d'amour l'esquif aborde et me dépose jetant son amarre au pilier devant une façade rose sur le marbre d'un escalier how exquisite they were as one read them one seemed to be floating down the green waterways of the pink and pearl city seated in a black gondola with silver prow and trailing curtains the mere lines looked to him like those straight lines of turquoise blue that follow one as one pushes out to the lido the sudden flashes of colour reminded him of the gleam of the opal and iris-throated birds that flutter round the tall honeycombed campanile or stalk with such stately grace through the dim dust-stained arcades leaning back with half-closed eyes he kept saying over and over to himself devant une façade rose sur le marbre d'un escalier the whole of venice was in those two lines he remembered the autumn that he had passed there and a wonderful love that had stirred him to mad delightful follies there was romance in every place but venice like oxford had kept the background for romance and to the true romantic background was everything or almost everything basil had been with him part of the time and had gone wild over tintoret poor basil what a horrible way for a man to die he sighed and took up the volume again and tried to forget 
he read of the swallows that fly in and out of the little cafe at smyrna where the hadjis sit counting their amber beads and the turbaned merchants smoke their long tasselled pipes and talk gravely to each other he read of the obelisk in the place de la concorde that weeps tears of granite in its lonely sunless exile and longs to be back by the hot lotus-covered nile where there are sphinxes and rose-red ibises and white vultures with gilded claws and crocodiles with small beryl eyes that crawl over the green steaming mud he began to brood over those verses which drawing music from kiss-stained marble tell of that curious statue that gautier compares to a contralto voice the monstre charmant that couches in the porphyry room of the louvre but after a time the book fell from his hand he grew nervous and a horrible fit of terror came over him what if alan campbell should be out of england days would elapse before he could come back perhaps he might refuse to come what could he do then every moment was of vital importance they had been great friends once five years before almost inseparable indeed then the intimacy had come suddenly to an end when they met in society now it was only dorian gray who smiled alan campbell never did he was an extremely clever young man though he had no real appreciation of the visible arts and whatever little sense of the beauty of poetry he possessed he had gained entirely from dorian his dominant intellectual passion was for science at cambridge he had spent a great deal of his time working in the laboratory and had taken a good class in the natural science tripos of his year indeed he was still devoted to the study of chemistry and had a laboratory of his own in which he used to shut himself up all day long greatly to the annoyance of his mother who had set her heart on his standing for parliament and had a vague idea that a chemist was a person who made up prescriptions he was an excellent musician however as well and played both the violin and the piano better than most amateurs in fact it was music that had first brought him and dorian gray together music and that indefinable attraction that dorian seemed to be able to exercise whenever he wished and indeed exercised often without being conscious of it they had met at lady berkshire's the night that rubinstein played there and after that used to be always seen together at the opera and wherever good music was going on for eighteen months their intimacy lasted campbell was always either at selby royal or in grosvenor square to him as to many others dorian gray was the type of everything that is wonderful and fascinating in life whether or not a quarrel had taken place between them no one ever knew but suddenly people remarked that they scarcely spoke when they met and that campbell seemed always to go away early from any party at which dorian gray was present he had changed too was strangely melancholy at times appeared almost to dislike hearing music and would never himself play giving us his excuse when he was called upon that he was so absorbed in science that he had no time left in which to practice and this was certainly true every day he seemed to become more interested in biology and his name appeared once or twice in some of the scientific reviews in connection with certain curious experiments this was the man dorian gray was waiting for 
every second he kept glancing at the clock as the minutes went by he became horribly agitated at last he got up and began to pace up and down the room looking like a beautiful caged thing he took long stealthy strides his hands were curiously cold the suspense became unbearable time seemed to him to be crawling with feet of lead while he by monstrous winds was being swept towards the jagged edge of some black cleft or precipice he knew what was waiting for him there saw it indeed and shuddering crushed with dank hands his burning lids as though he would have robbed the very brain of sight and driven the eyeballs back into their cave it was useless the brain had its own food on which it battened and the imagination made grotesque by terror twisted and distorted as a living thing by pain danced like some foul puppet on a stand and grinned through moving masks then suddenly time stopped for him yes that blind slow breathing thing crawled no more and horrible thoughts time being dead raced nimbly on in front and dragged a hideous future from its grave and showed it to him he stared at it its very horror made him stone at last the door opened and his servant entered he turned glazed eyes upon him mr campbell sir said the man a sigh of relief broke from his parched lips and the colour came back to his cheeks ask him to come in at once francis he felt that he was himself again his mood of cowardice had passed away the man bowed and retired in a few moments alan campbell walked in looking very stern and rather pale his pallor being intensified by his coal-black hair and dark eyebrows alan this is kind of you i thank you for coming i had intended never to enter your house again gray but you said it was a matter of life and death his voice was hard and cold he spoke with slow deliberation there was a look of contempt in the steady searching gaze that he turned on dorian he kept his hands in the pockets of his astrachan coat and seemed not to have noticed the gesture with which he had been greeted yes it is a matter of life and death alan and to more than one person sit down campbell took a chair by the table and dorian sat opposite to him the two men's eyes met in dorian's there was infinite pity he knew that what he was going to do was dreadful after a strained moment of silence he leaned across and said very quietly but watching the effect of each word upon the face of him he had sent for alan in a locked room at the top of this house a room to which nobody but myself has access a dead man is seated at a table he has been dead ten hours now don't stir and don't look at me like that who the man is why he died how he died are matters that do not concern you what you have to do is this stop gray i don't want to know anything further whether what you have told me is true or not true doesn't concern me i entirely decline to be mixed up in your life keep your horrible secrets to yourself they don't interest me any more alan they will have to interest you this one will have to interest you i'm awfully sorry for you alan but i can't help myself you are the one man who is able to save me i am forced to bring you into the matter i have no option alan you are scientific you know about chemistry and things of that kind you have made experiments 
What you have got to do is to destroy the thing that is upstairs, to destroy it so that not a vestige of it will be left. Nobody saw this person come into the house. Indeed, at the present moment he is supposed to be in Paris. He will not be missed for months. When he is missed, there must be no trace of him found here. You, Alan, you must change him, and everything that belongs to him, into a handful of ashes that I may scatter in the air. You are mad, Dorian. Ah, I was waiting for you to call me, Dorian. You are mad, I tell you. Mad to imagine that I would trace a finger to help you. Mad to make this monstrous confession. I will have nothing to do with this matter, whatever it is. Do you think I am going to peril my reputation for you? What is it to me, what devil's work you are up to? It was suicide, Alan. I am glad of that. But who drove him to it? You, I should fancy. Do you still refuse to do this for me? Of course I refuse. I will have absolutely nothing to do with it. I don't care what shame comes on you. You deserve it all. I should not be sorry to see you disgraced, publicly disgraced. How dare you ask me, of all men in the world, to mix myself up in this horror? I should have thought you knew more about people's characters. Your friend, Lord Henry Wotton, can't have taught you much about psychology, whatever else he has taught you. Nothing will induce me to stir a step to help you. You have come to the wrong man. Go to some of your friends. Don't come to me. Alan, it was murder. I killed him. You don't know what he had made me suffer. Whatever my life is, he had more to do with the making and marrying of it than poor Harry has had. He may not have intended it. The result was the same. Murder? Good God, Dorian, is that what you have come to? I shall not inform upon you. It is not my business. Besides, without my stirring in the matter, you are certain to be arrested. Nobody ever commits a crime without doing something stupid. But I will have nothing to do with it. You must have something to do with it. Wait, wait a moment, listen to me. Only listen, Alan. All I ask of you is to perform a certain scientific experiment. You go to hospitals and dead houses, and the horrors that you do there don't affect you. If in some hideous dissecting room or fetid laboratory you found this man lying on a leaden table with red gutters scooped out in it for the blood to flow through, you would simply look upon him as an admirable subject. You would not turn a hair. You would not believe that you were doing anything wrong. On the contrary, you would probably feel that you were benefiting the human race, or increasing the sum of knowledge in the world, or gratifying intellectual curiosity, or something of that kind. What I want you to do is merely what you have often done before. Indeed, to destroy a body must be far less horrible than what you are accustomed to work at. And, remember, it is the only piece of evidence against me. If it is discovered, I am lost. And it is sure to be discovered unless you help me. I have no desire to help you. You forget that. I am simply indifferent to the whole thing. It has nothing to do with me. Alan, I entreat you. Think of the position I am in. Just before you came, I almost fainted with terror. You may know terror yourself some day. No, don't think of that. Look at the matter purely from the scientific point of view. You don't inquire where the dead things on which you experiment come from. Don't inquire now. I have told you too much as it is. But I beg of you to do this. We were friends once, Alan. Don't speak about those days, Dorian. They are dead. The dead linger sometimes. The man upstairs will not go away. He is sitting at the table with bowed head and outstretched arms. Alan! Alan! If you don't come to my assistance, I am ruined. Why, they will hang me, Alan. Don't you understand? They will hang me for what I have done. There is no good in prolonging this scene. I absolutely refuse to do anything in the matter. It is insane of you to ask me. You refuse? Yes. I entreat you, Alan. It is useless. The same look of pity came into Dorian Gray's eyes. Then he stretched out his hand, took a piece of paper, and wrote something on it. 
he read it over twice folded it carefully and pushed it across the table having done this he got up and went over to the window campbell looked at him in surprise and then took up the paper and opened it as he read it his face became ghastly pale and he fell back in his chair a horrible sense of sickness came over him he felt as if his heart was beating itself to death in some empty hollow after two or three minutes of terrible silence dorian turned round and came and stood behind him putting his hand upon his shoulder i am so sorry for you alan he murmured but you leave me no alternative i have a letter written already here it is you see the address if you don't help me i must send it if you don't help me i will send it you know what the result will be but you are going to help me it is impossible for you to refuse now i tried to spare you you will do me the justice to admit that you were stern harsh offensive you treated me as no man has ever dared to treat me no living man at any rate i bore it all now it is time for me to dictate terms campbell buried his face in his hands and a shudder passed through him yes it is my turn to dictate terms alan you know what they are the thing is quite simple come don't work yourself into this fever the thing has to be done face it and do it a groan broke from campbell's lips and he shivered all over the ticking of the clock on the mantelpiece seemed to him to be dividing time into separate atoms of agony, each of which was too terrible to be borne. He felt as if an iron ring was being slowly tightened round his forehead, as if the disgrace with which he was threatened had already come upon him. The hand upon his shoulder weighed like a hand of lead it was intolerable it seemed to crush him come alan you must decide at once i cannot do it he said mechanically as though words could alter things you must you have no choice don't delay he hesitated a moment is there a fire in the room upstairs yes there is a gas fire with asbestos i shall have to go home and get some things from the laboratory no alan you must not leave the house write out on a sheet of notepaper what you want and my servant will take a cab and bring the things back to you campbell scrawled a few lines blotted them and addressed an envelope to his assistant dorian took the note up and read it carefully then he rang the bell and gave it to his valet with orders to return as soon as possible and to bring the things with him as the hall door shut campbell started nervously and having got up from the chair went over to the chimney-piece he was shivering with a kind of ague for nearly twenty minutes neither of the men spoke a fly buzzed noisily about the room and the ticking of the clock was like the beat of a hammer as the chime struck one campbell turned round and looking at dorian gray saw that his eyes were filled with tears there was something in the purity and refinement of that sad face that seemed to enrage him you are infamous absolutely infamous he muttered hush alan you have saved my life said dorian your life good heavens what a life that is you have gone from corruption to corruption and now you have culminated in crime in doing what i am going to do what you force me to do it is not of your life that i am thinking ah alan murmured dorian with a sigh i wish you had a thousandth part of the pity for me that i have for you he turned away as he spoke and stood looking out at the garden campbell made no answer 
after about ten minutes a knock came to the door and the servant entered carrying a large mahogany chest of chemicals with a long coil of steel and platinum wire and two rather curiously shaped iron clamps shall i leave the things here sir he asked campbell yes said dorian and i am afraid francis that i have another errand for you what is the name of the man at richmond who supplies selby with orchids harden sir yes harden you must go down to richmond at once see harden personally and tell him to send twice as many orchids as i ordered and to have as few white ones as possible in fact i don't want any white ones it is a lovely day francis and richmond is a very pretty place otherwise i wouldn't bother you about it no trouble sir at what time shall i be back dorian looked at campbell how long will your experiment take alan he said in a calm indifferent voice the presence of a third person in the room seemed to give him extraordinary courage campbell frowned and bit his lip it will take about five hours he answered it will be time enough then if you are back at half past seven francis or stay just leave my things out for dressing you can have the evening to yourself i am not dining at home so i shall not want you thank you sir said the man leaving the room now alan there is not a moment to be lost how heavy this chest is i'll take it for you you bring the other things he spoke rapidly and in an authoritative manner campbell felt dominated by him they left the room together when they reached the top landing dorian took out the key and turned it in the lock then he stopped and a troubled look came into his eyes he shuddered i don't think i can go in alan he murmured it is nothing to me i don't require you said campbell coldly dorian half opened the door as he did so he saw the face of his portrait leering in the sunlight on the floor in front of it the torn curtain was lying he remembered that the night before he had forgotten for the first time in his life to hide the fatal canvas and was about to rush forward when he drew back with a shudder what was that loathsome red dew that gleamed wet and glistening on one of the hands as though the canvas had sweated blood how horrible it was more horrible it seemed to him for the moment than the silent thing that he knew was stretched across the table the thing whose grotesque misshapen shadow on the spotted carpet showed him that it had not stirred but was still there as he had left it he heaved a deep breath opened the door a little wider and with half-closed eyes and averted head walked quickly in determined that he would not look even once upon the dead man then stooping down and taking up the gold and purple hanging he flung it right over the picture there he stopped feeling afraid to turn round and his eyes fixed themselves on the intricacies of the pattern before him he heard campbell bringing in the heavy chest and the irons and the other things that he had required for his dreadful work he began to wonder if he and basil hallward had ever met and if so what they had thought of each other leave me now said a stern voice behind him he turned and hurried out just conscious that the dead man had been thrust back into the chair and that campbell was gazing into a glistening yellow face as he was going downstairs he heard the key being turned in the lock it was long after seven when campbell came back into the library he was pale but absolutely calm i have done what you asked me to do he muttered and now good-bye let us never see each other again you have saved me from ruin alan 
I cannot forget that, said Dorian simply. As soon as Campbell had left, he went upstairs. There was a horrible smell of nitric acid in the room. But the thing that had been sitting at the table was gone. End of chapter 14 The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde Chapter 15 that evening at eight-thirty, exquisitely dressed and wearing a large buttonhole of Palmer violets, Dorian Gray was ushered into Lady Narborough's drawing-room by bowing servants. His forehead was throbbing with maddened nerves, and he felt wildly excited, but his manner, as he bent over his hostess's hand, was as easy and graceful as ever perhaps one never seems so much at one's ease as when one has to play a part certainly no one looking at dorian gray that night could have believed that he had passed through a tragedy as horrible as any tragedy of our age those finely shaped fingers could never have clutched a knife for sin nor those smiling lips have cried out on god and goodness he himself could not help wondering at the calm of his demeanour and for a moment felt keenly the terrible pleasure of a double life it was a small party got up rather in a hurry by lady narborough who was a very clever woman with what lord henry used to describe as the remains of really remarkable ugliness she had proved an excellent wife to one of our most tedious ambassadors and having buried her husband properly in a marble mausoleum which she had herself designed and married off her daughters to some rich rather elderly men she devoted herself now to the pleasures of french fiction french cookery and french esprit when she could get it dorian was one of her especial favourites and she always told him that she was extremely glad she had not met him in early life i know my dear i should have fallen madly in love with you she used to say and thrown my bonnet right over the mills for your sake. It is most fortunate that you were not thought of at the time. As it was, our bonnets were so unbecoming, and the mills were so occupied in trying to raise the wind, that I never had even a flirtation with anybody. However, that was all Narborough's fault. He was dreadfully short-sighted, and there is no pleasure in taking in a husband who never sees anything." her guests this evening were rather tedious the fact was as she explained to dorian behind a very shabby fan one of her married daughters had come up quite suddenly to stay with her and to make matters worse had actually brought her husband with her i think it is most unkind of her my dear she whispered of course i go and stay with them every summer after i come from homburg but then an old woman like me must have fresh air sometimes, and besides, I really wake them up. You don't know what an existence they lead down there. It is pure, unadulterated country life. They get up early, because they have so much to do, and go to bed early, because they have so little to think about. There has not been a scandal in the neighbourhood since the time of Queen Elizabeth and consequently they all fall asleep after dinner. You shan't sit next either of them. You shall sit by me, and amuse me." Dorian murmured a graceful compliment, and looked round the room. Yes, it was certainly a tedious party. Two of the people he had never seen before, and the others consisted of Ernest Harrowden, one of those middle-aged mediocrities so common in London clubs, who have no enemies, but are thoroughly disliked by their friends. Lady Ruxton, 
an overdressed woman of forty-seven with a hooked nose who was always trying to get herself compromised but was so peculiarly plain that to her great disappointment no one would ever believe anything against her mrs erlynne a pushing nobody with a delightful lisp and venetian red hair lady alice chapman his hostess's daughter a dowdy dull girl with one of those characteristic british faces that once seen are never remembered and her husband a red-cheeked white-whiskered creature who like so many of his class was under the impression that inordinate joviality can atone for an entire lack of ideas he was rather sorry he had come till lady narborough looking at the great ormolu gilt clock that sprawled in gaudy curves on the mauve draped mantel-shelf exclaimed how horrid of lord henry wotton to be so late i sent round to him this morning on chance and he promised faithfully not to disappoint me it was some consolation that harry was to be there and when the door opened and he heard his slow musical voice lending charm to some insincere apology he ceased to feel bored but at dinner he could not eat anything plate after plate went away untasted lady narborough kept scolding him for what she called an insult to poor adolphe who invented the menu specially for you and now and then lord henry looked across at him wondering at his silence and abstracted manner from time to time the butler filled his glass with champagne he drank eagerly and his thirst seemed to increase dorian said lord henry at last as the chauffeur was being handed round what is the matter with you to-night you are quite out of sorts i believe he is in love cried lady narborough and that he is afraid to tell me for fear i should be jealous he is quite right i certainly should dear lady narborough murmured dorian smiling i have not been in love for a whole week not in fact since madame de ferrol left town oh, how you men can fall in love with that woman exclaimed the old lady i really cannot understand it it is simply because she remembers you when you were a little girl lady narborough said lord henry she is the one link between us and your short frocks she does not remember my short frocks at all lord henry but i remember her very well at vienna thirty years ago and how decollete she was then she is still decollete he answered taking an olive in his long fingers and when she is in a very smart gown she looks like an edition de luxe of a bad french novel she is really wonderful and full of surprises her capacity for family affection is extraordinary when her third husband died her hair turned quite gold from grief how can you harry cried dorian it is a most romantic explanation laughed the hostess but her third husband lord henry you don't mean to say ferrol is the fourth certainly lady narborough i don't believe a word of it well ask mr gray he is one of her most intimate friends is it true mr gray she assures me so lady narborough said dorian i asked her whether like marguerite de navarre she had their hearts embalmed and hung at her girdle she told me she didn't because none of them had had any hearts at all four husbands upon my word that is trop de zelle trop de dash i tell her said dorian oh she is audacious enough for anything my dear and what is ferrol like i don't know him the husbands of very beautiful women belong to the criminal classes said lord henry sipping his wine lady narborough hit him with her fan lord henry i am not at all surprised that the world says that you are extremely wicked but what world says that asked lord henry elevating his eyebrows 
It can only be the next world. This world and I are on excellent terms. Everybody I know says you are very wicked, cried the old lady, shaking her head. Lord Henry looked serious for some moments. It is perfectly monstrous, he said at last. The way people go about nowadays, saying things against one behind one's back that are absolutely and entirely true. Isn't he incorrigible? cried Dorian, leaning forward in his chair. I hope so, said his hostess, laughing. But really, if you all worship Madame de Ferrol in this ridiculous way, I shall have to marry again, so has to be in the fashion. You will never marry again, Lady Narborough, broke in Lord Henry. You were far too happy. When a woman marries again, it is because she detested her first husband. When a man marries again, it is because he adored his first wife. Women try their luck. Men risk theirs. Narbra wasn't perfect, cried the old lady. If he had been, you would not have loved him, my dear lady, was the rejoinder. Women love us for our defects. If we have enough of them, they will forgive us everything, even our intellects. You will never ask me to dinner again after saying this, I'm afraid, Lady Narborough, but it is quite true. Of course it is true, Lord Henry. If women did not love you for your defects, where would you all be? Not one of you would ever be married. You would all be a set of unfortunate bachelors. Not, however, that that would alter you much. Nowadays all the married men live like bachelors, and all the bachelors like married men. Fin de siècle murmured lord henry fin du globe answered his hostess i wish it were fin du globe said dorian with a sigh life is a great disappointment ah my dear cried lady narborough putting on her gloves don't tell me that you have exhausted life when a man says that one knows that life has exhausted him lord henry is very wicked and I sometimes wish that I had been. But you were made to be good. You look so good. I must find you a nice wife. Lord Henry, don't you think that Mr. Gray should get married? I am always telling him so, Lady Narborough, said Lord Henry with a bow. Well, we must look out for a suitable match for him. I shall go through Debrett carefully to-night, and draw out a list of all the eligible young ladies. With their ages, Lady Narborough? asked Dorian. Of course, with their ages. Slightly edited. But nothing must be done in a hurry. I want it to be what the Morning Post calls a suitable alliance, and I want you both to be happy. What nonsense people talk about happy marriages! exclaimed Lord Henry. A man can be happy with any woman, as long as he does not love her. Ah, what a cynic you are! cried the old lady, pushing back her chair and nodding to Lady Ruxton. You must come and dine with me again soon. You are really an admirable tonic, much better than what Sir Andrew prescribes for me. You must tell me what people you would like to meet, though. I want it to be a delightful gathering. I like men who have a future, and women who have a past, he answered. Or do you think that would make it a petticoat party? I fear so, she said, laughing as she stood up. A thousand pardons, my dear Lady Ruxton, she added. I didn't see you hadn't finished your cigarette. Never mind, Lady Narborough. I smoke a great deal too much. I'm going to limit myself for the future. Pray don't, Lady Ruxton, said Lord Henry. Moderation is a fatal thing. Enough is as bad as a meal. More than enough is as good as a feast. Lady Ruxton glanced at him curiously. You must come and explain that to me some afternoon, Lord Henry. It sounds a fascinating theory. She murmured as she swept out of the room. Now mind you don't stay too long over your politics and scandal, cried Lady Narborough from the door. If you do, we are sure to squabble upstairs. The men laughed, and Mr. Chapman got up solemnly from the foot of the table, and came up to the top. Dorian Gray changed his seat, and went and sat by Lord Henry. Mr. Chapman began to talk in a loud voice about the situation in the House of Commons. He guffawed at his adversaries. The word doctrinaire 
word full of terror to the british mind reappeared from time to time between his explosions an alliterative prefix served as an ornament of oratory he hoisted the union jack on the pinnacles of thought the inherited stupidity of the race sound english common sense he jovially termed it was shown to be the proper bulwark for society a smile curved lord henry's lips and he turned round and looked at dorian are you better my dear fellow he asked he seemed rather out of sorts at dinner i am quite well harry i am tired that is all you were charming last night the little duchess is quite devoted to you she tells me she is going down to selby she has promised to come on the twentieth is monmouth to be there too oh yes harry he bores me dreadfully almost as much as he bores her she is very clever too clever for a woman she lacks the indefinable charm of weakness it is the feet of clay that make the gold of the image precious her feet are very pretty but they are not feet of clay white porcelain feet if you like they have been through the fire and what fire does not destroy it hardens she has had experiences how long has she been married asked dorian an eternity she tells me i believe according to the peerage it is ten years but ten years with monmouth must have been like eternity with time thrown in who else is coming oh the willoughby's lord rugby and his wife our hostess geoffrey clouston the usual set i have asked lord grotrian i like him said lord henry a great many people don't but i find him charming he atones for being occasionally somewhat overdressed by being always absolutely overeducated he is a very modern type i don't know if you'll be able to come harry he may have to go to monte carlo with his father ah what a nuisance people's people are try and make him come by the way dorian you ran off very early last night you left before eleven what did you do afterwards did you go straight home dorian glanced at him hurriedly and frowned no harry he said at last i did not get home till nearly three did you go to the club yes he answered then he bit his lip no i don't mean that i didn't go to the club i walked about i forget what i did how inquisitive you are harry you always want to know what one has been doing I always want to forget what I have been doing. I came in at half past two, if you wish to know the exact time. I had left my latchkey at home, and my servant had to let me in. If you want any corroborative evidence on the subject, you can ask him. Lord Henry shrugged his shoulders. <laughs> my dear fellow, as if I cared. Let us go up to the drawing room. No sherry, thank you, Mr. Chapman. Something has happened to you, Dorian. Tell me what it is. You are not yourself to-night. Don't mind me, Harry. I am irritable and out of temper. I shall come around and see you to-morrow or next day. Make my excuses to Lady Navra. I shan't go upstairs. I shall go home. I must go home. All right, Dorian. I dare say I shall see you to-morrow at tea-time. The Duchess is coming. I will try to be there, Harry he said leaving the room as he drove back to his own house he was conscious that the sense of terror he thought he had strangled had come back to him lord henry's casual questioning had made him lose his nerves for the moment and he wanted his nerves still things that were dangerous had to be destroyed he winced he hated the idea of even touching them yet it had to be done he realized that and when he had locked the door of his library he opened the secret press into which he had thrust basil hallward's coat and bag a huge fire was blazing he piled another log on it the smell of the singeing clothes and burning leather was horrible it took him three quarters of an hour to consume everything at the end he felt faint and sick and having lit some algerian pastilles in a pierced copper brazier 
he bathed his hands and forehead with a cool musk-scented vinegar suddenly he started his eyes grew strangely bright and he gnawed nervously at his underlip between two of the windows stood a large florentine cabinet made out of ebony and inlaid with ivory and blue lapis he watched it as though it were a thing that could fascinate and make afraid as though it held something that he longed for and yet almost loathed his breath quickened a mad craving came over him he lit a cigarette and then threw it away his eyelids drooped till the long fringed lashes almost touched his cheek but he still watched the cabinet at last he got up from the sofa on which he had been lying went over to it and having unlocked it touched some hidden spring a triangular drawer passed slowly out his fingers moved instinctively towards it dipped in and closed on something it was a small chinese box of black and gold dust lacquer elaborately wrought the sides patterned with curved waves and the silken cords hung with round crystals and tasselled in plaited metal threads he opened it inside was a green paste waxy in lustre the odour curiously heavy and persistent he hesitated for some moments with a strangely immobile smile upon his face then shivering though the atmosphere of the room was terribly hot he drew himself up and glanced at the clock it was twenty minutes to twelve he put the box back shutting the cabinet doors as he did so and went into his bedroom as midnight was striking bronze blows upon the dusky air dorian gray dressed commonly and with a muffler wrapped round his throat crept quietly out of his house in bond street he found a hansom with a good horse he hailed it and in a low voice gave the driver an address the man shook his head it is too far for me he muttered here is a sovereign for you said dorian you shall have another if you drive fast all right sir answered the man you'll be there in an hour and after his fare had got in he turned his horse round and drove rapidly towards the river End of chapter 15